that better? All right. So um, my name is Brian Dagenhart, and I am at A.T. Stowe University. I'm the director of the A.T. Stowe Research Institute and also the assistant vice president for osteopathic research at the university. Um, I uh, came to Kirksville. I graduated from Des Moines University, but came and did the residency under Dr. Michael Kachera and his dad, and uh, ended thinking I was only going to be there for two years because I swore Kirksville was not going to suck me in. But I am still there, and unfortunately, I've been there um, now 20 years. And so uh, who would have ever thought? So what we're going to be showing you today, because I know you've gotten some experience in regards to the work that we've been developing at, at the Research Institute. And I want to give you a, a, a certainly better perspective of what, had, what has brought the models here that you've been working with to give you some objective feedback regarding developing palpatory skills, but also there's a lot that we've developed that, um, um, that is only on that campus. And we're going to show you about what we think the future of training will be and the feedback that is possible for us to receive in regards to guiding the development of palpation. Where do I point? Okay. So the institute was developed and uh, established in 2001. get to the right spot here, maybe that will work. All right, that's going to be hard. <laughs> yeah, why don't we do that? Okay, excellent. And, and our goal is to advance whole person health care uh, and wellness through the development and support of premier clinical and translational research. Uh, what's unique about our institute is that our goal is that uh, the work we support all directly relates to what we do as clinicians. Um, we don't really support any pure um, uh, basic science research within our institute. Um, and our goal is to explore and to advance the scientific evidence base of osteopathic medicine and the associated health professions within A.T. Stowe University. We have about 15 uh, different uh, uh, programs within the university, and our goal is actually to disseminate the osteopathic philosophy and perspectives, not just within osteopathic medicine, but within the healthcare field in general. And I think that was the original intention of Dr. Stowe as well. So what I want to do is to look at palpatory skills, its development, and how that leads to diagnosis. And in order to do that, really want to have you look closely at what happens between your hands and the body. Because it is not as simple as we think. And unfortunately, when we get into medical school, we f get sucked into this flow of water and we're trying to break through and, and it, it is so aggressive that it almost rips, rips our clothes off and we're just bar barely hanging on. But we do need to take a step back even though we're in the midst of all of that, to understand aspects of the big picture. And I don't think I'm going to be telling you anything that you've already been uh, exposed to, but I hope that th this will provide an, a framework to think a little bit more uh, deeply and perhaps critically about these things. So in the palpation of somatic dysfunction, if we can go back to the slide before, uh, there are many characteristics that we feel we can discern. When we start thinking about what is it that we actually feel to be able to discern these things, it becomes a very complicated question. And a lot of people think that what we do with our hands is very simplistic, old-fashioned, so forth, but is ex actually extremely complex. 
and, and I hope as we look at some of these factors as we go through the presentation that will become clearer. We take these characteristics that are somehow developed from a variety of receptors in our hands, go through major central nervous processing, and then from that we have brought, broken it down into four types of tests. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of processing that occurs behind each of these tests um, that we probably do not recognize as, as thoroughly as we should. Uh, and that's what science is all about. Science is helping us to become more deeply aware of the phenomenon that we're observing and how we are, are observing it. So let's take an example of this student who obviously is, you would think is uh, evaluating aspects of the knee, and I'll assume that's the case, although what he's actually doing is involving the hip. And so what's going on in his hands is not actually what he's perceiving at all. It's actually, you know, two feet proximal to that. And so how do you, how does, how do you do that? You know, where did that awareness come from? You know, what are, what is the neurophysiology behind that? We've been really not asked those questions much, let alone, you know, how do we m monitor and observe it. But in this situation, so let's assume that he obviously is perceiving things within his hand. And so that is coming up, and we know there are four broad categories of receptors in our hands, thousands of receptors within the surface of the hand that's interacting and creating this information um, uh, to our brain. The brain goes ahead and it has to then interpret that sensation. Uh, and it not o do only does it based off of what he's currently feeling, but based off of everything that he had felt previously to that moment. So he takes his memory, he takes the sensory information at that time, and from that comes to some type of conclusion that then results in a change in what he's doing, whether it's diagnostic or therapeutic. Very complicated sets of, of phenomenon occurring here. Um, and, uh, and I don't think often a student body recognizes and, and gives, gives this aspect of our clinical work uh, the credibility and the credit that it deserves. So let's look at uh, the C the teaching approach that we have in manipulative medicine. So as a general rule, and, and, and t this afternoon may be an example, it begins with a presentation, generally about background information, about what you're going to see, what you're going to do, what the anatomy is, where it may have come from historically within the profession. And it doesn't matter what type of modern technology is involved in the teaching, it's still basically presenting that background information. It's presented and then, then generally the teacher demonstrates the learning um, uh, um, point of that day. So maybe it'll be muscle energy techniques to the rib cage as an example. And so you watch that work and then go ahead um, as, as you're watching it. This is the Kirksville lab. We have 180 students. It is the Roman forum of osteopathy as far as I'm concerned. You have this big stage, you have your big uh, pictures on the side, and you hope somehow from this distant vantage point that you're going to be able to see enough to then be able to reproduce what they just did in your own hands. You can come to your own conclusion whether or not how that actually goes. But then they ask, okay, now it's your turn to do that, and you go ahead and you begin to independently practice your technique. And so you have what maybe, maybe five to ten minutes of doing that within the lab, and they say, well, now you go home and it's your job to practice it. And you practice it and you practice it, and then you hope that through that, that what you saw, which a teacher demonstrated, is what you end up developing over time. So what happens then is, is then we have practical exams or we have, you know, fellowships or residencies where you try to get some, some direct feedback on what's going on. And it's generally a, a single moment of somebody from a distance watching what's occurring and 
hopefully you will get confirmation that what you're doing is correct. Um, usually the person is only there for a moment and they leave and then you're still back at the original point of then you still have to figure out what you're doing on your own. The current evidence when it comes to manual uh, therapy as a, as a broad discipline is that uh, when we look at the reliability of what we do, the evidence says the inter-examiner reliability tends to be very poor. What you do and what I do, if we were to do it on the same person, we'd find different things. But we know significant improvement occurs if you were to just evaluate that person serially, so looking at intra-examiner reliability. My, um, and we'll talk about what my hypothesis in regards to that. So let's take an example of one of the fancy instruments in our basic science arena. And what happens if we go ahead and we can easily rebuild that over and over again. Um, and after rebuilding it over and over, if we then set those instruments, you know, across this lab or at different rooms, there's no way that we would feel confident that each of these instruments would, go, would produce the same information if they didn't get finely calibrated. You have to have certain standards to, in order to fine tune the output that it, these instruments produce in order to be able to have the reliability and consistency that we expect. But we don't do that when it comes to the instruments in our hands. That's the problem that we have. Now, it doesn't make that what we, how we use them when we talk about therapeutic value versus a scientific consistency are very different phenomena here. And I don't want you to, s to come to a conclusion that because we have poor inter-examiner reliability and so forth, that it invalidates the work that we do uh, in the clinical outcomes. That is certainly not the case, because if that was the case, osteopathy would not now exist after 122 years of teaching. Okay. So in 2008, we received an endowment from the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation. It's a $4 million endowment that supports this work that we've been doing. And the goal of the endowment is to support research investigating the reliability of osteopathic palpatory tests and establishing means to determine the validity and accuracy of palpatory diagnosis and to evaluate the clinical relevance of palpatory tests and manipulative treatments. Now, if you think about it, it, we're, it is kind of a scientific process of first, you know, determining, you know, regarding our palpatory tests, what is accurate, what is valid, and then putting those tests into issues of looking at clinical relevance. So uh, at this point in time, most of our work is looking at the development of valid and accurate tests because unless we have them, we can't really look at issues of clinical relevance. Most of the time in research as clinicians, we want to show that what we do works. But from a scientific process, we got to first understand what we do diagnostically consistently be able to apply that, consistently apply it from a treatment perspective and look at related outcomes. So first we have to develop methodologies to look at accuracy and validity. And the model program uh, is our first step to do that. And so that allows us to calibrate and quantify uh, certain aspects of palpatory skills. Yeah, we're going to be clicking through these pretty quick. So, so let's just take an example of, of the um, pelvis. And so we had three different examiners. And if we had ways of looking at fingerprints, we could really clearly see examiner one was in one place, examiner two was in one place. If we look at the examiner two, we can see that the right thumb or the left thumb on the right ASIS was right where it needed to be. But the left one was medial and off a little bit. And so we, at this point in time, is the only feedback we get is visual from a person who's standing obliquely from what we're doing. They may come 
and palpate and, and they'll agree with you or disagree with you, but it assumes that what they, where their thumbs are were exactly where your thumbs are as well. And so what we've done is developed models. Uh, we've constructed them. We found it ways of calibration. We used various uh, uh, measuring devices in order to go through the calibration process. We construct them uh, on campus and we have a, an external company that also assists in the construction process. And, and so these are models you've seen. You've seen the paper models that look at um, um, asymmetry in that coronal plane. We see these wooden ones where you have to palpate through cushions. We have uh, some things that work for the lumbar spine. And then our, more gra our most advanced model at this time are our pelvic models. And okay, and continue on. So what type of results have we been able to see as a result of, of this uh, program? And so here we have um, um, two classes from different years, and we, ha we have different times we test the class. So our baseline exam occurs at when they first start school. This one occurs after they've had their um, teaching looking at the lumbar region. This is after the pelvic region. And then we have an end of the year uh, final exam. And so here with this baseline, we can see at for the paper PSIS at one millimeter of asymmetry, the classes were basically right around 50%. And when it got to two millimeters, it was now almost up to 80%. Three millimeters, uh, 85 to 89%. Four millimeters was now getting between the 90 and 95 percent. Um, and we can now see then at the end of the year that at one millimeter it was now 85 to 90 percent, 95 percent at two millimeters, and basically 100 percent at three millimeters. So this clearly shows that there was an impact on the learning process in refining those palpatory skills. And we see the same phenomenon when we're looking at the paper uh, ASIS as, as well there. Um, we can show this with our pelvic, uh, with the lumbar spine. And so we have, no, we'll have you go back. I'm just trying to get my arrow to show up there, which is not. OK, so, so here we can look at 80% uh, accuracy, 90%, 95%. We can look at the models, the different types of models, where th whether they were covered or uncovered. And we can clearly show at what millimeter of asymmetry people have certain accuracy. And so just as if you were to order a hemoglobin uh, test, we know that when that hemoglobin comes, there's a vi variability of range of about one gram on on each side of that. And so if it comes back and, and you know, you're trying to rebuild the blood and it comes back and it's three-tenths difference, the bottom line is that it's really not different. Now we know exactly when a test is good and when you should see it as being a, a valid test. And, we, and each individual knows it for their own skills. And so this is a really important aspect of, of this um, uh, the information we're getting from this type of testing. Yeah. So models are nice, but the bottom line is that ha you know we're working on humans. That's our, our whole life is based on that. And, and so we've developed a system called the Digital Camera Measurement System, which allows us to evaluate the localization and assessment of, of these skills and these positional asymmetry skills on humans. And, and so, it, once again, it would be nice if we had x-ray vision to actually see, you know, that what we were feeling was what we thought we were feeling, but we don't have that ability. So we are using high-resolution uh, digital cameras in order to, d to uh, develop um, this system. Uh, we, go, we are able to evaluate eight different landmarks um, of the body. Um, and looking at these landmarks within the coronal plane. So there's a total of 13 different tests 
uh, that this system has been used for. And it can be used with people standing, supine, or prone in order for us to do these assessments. Uh, once again, we went through uh, several years of developing this methodology. We had collaborators at another university to help us to do the software in order to make sure our calibration with the optics associated with the cameras were appropriate for us to, to get um, the resolution that we want for this type of system. And now we can actually evaluate the degree of asymmetry that you would palpate on a human. Whether, and you can see it's down to the hundredth of a millimeter. Uh, and we have to have certain references on the hands in order for us to know where you are perceiving what you're feeling. We don't have any external way, so we have tape markers in order for us to know that where we're measuring is actually where you are, are palpating or where you're focusing. And then we can take these images and we can then overlap them. So this is an image of a person evaluating one of our standardized patients. And these are two different people. And you can see their evaluation, ASIS, has very clearly resulted in different localization. So as I said, um, we aren't able um, with ASISs and certain landmarks to know exactly where that landmark is. So really, this system is designed to look at, at the reliability, whether it's when you do the test over several times, the intra-examiner intra reliability, or comparing you with other people within, within uh, your, your class. So here's an example of intra-examiner reliability. We have them go through and evaluate a group of, of patients, and then they come back around and they do it again. So th this was at one moment, and then they went ahead and they came back through and did it again. And you saw the second one, and for, on her side, she thought she was feeling the exact same spot. She had no idea that there was any variation at all until we actually then overlap them, those. And you can see that definitely, more than likely, the lower thumbs were probably closer towards the inferior um, angle of the sacrum versus up on that PSIS landmark. Okay. Here's another example, okay? First exam, second exam, we can overlap them, and you can see dead on, no question. There is, you, you, you know, the biggest issue I saw when I was on faculty under Dr. Mike was, and, and he had to deal with some of the consequences of the people that didn't agree with me, is I would come and I would check something and it would disagree with that person. They'd either accept that or they'd say, yeah, yeah, you know, that, I'm not sure that person was right, so they'd call over another faculty person who would do it. And if those two faculty members were incorrect, then the whole system ended up, and the belief and the credibility of the system just went away. And we guaranteed we lost that person for the life of that physician. Because we didn't, we can't, we weren't able to show this level of reliability, consistency, objectivity. You can see that even though some things shifted, you know, the thumbs haven't, you can see the outline of the arms, you don't see any variation. You know that the patient did not change, that what is being felt is accurate. Okay. So we can combine the DCMS and the model system, and this is what we're, we're doing right now in order to get as much immediate feedback that is accurate with our students. So we can take the models, we have these are reflectors um, that a 3D camera system sees. And we localize the, the, the gold standard landmark on the model. We know what the asymmetry of that model is. We take this picture, and then we go ahead and we have a person examine it. And then we can do the overlap. Go ahead. And we can see exactly where they place that thumb on that model, that on, with their left hand on, on that left denominant, they're right where they need to be. On that other one, they are, they are down on a different aspect of, of that structure. And then they can go ahead and, when they did it again, you can see it on that second time, that, that right hand, 
got exactly where it needed to be. So it's an amazing feedback tool to help to refine your skills based off of objective uh, um, uh, findings. Um, our biggest issue is not that the fact that our technique uh, of, of, of what we do is that far off. We, we actually just don't localize. If we, lo if we had developed better localization, most of the issues in our current literature, I bet, wouldn't exist. Because uh, I don't think it is a central a processing issue on our side of what our hands are telling us. It's just our hands aren't getting to the right places to make that. And if we're not getting to the same places, it doesn't matter what the test is, whether it's tissue texture or motion testing. We're doing different things, and we're comparing apples and oranges, and we're wondering why you know, we aren't demonstrating a better uh, scientific basis for what we're doing. Okay. So using the DCMS system on humans, uh, this is looking at uh, 80, over 80 examiners on three to 550 examinations. We can look at the different types of tests that we use consistently for evaluating the pelvis or, or uh, the various landmarks. And so this is looking at the AC joint, iliac crest, ASIS, greater trochanter, in a standing position, uh, ASI, uh, AC joint iliac crest, inferior angle of the scapula, PSIS in a standing position, supine and prone position. And we can see um, our goal is to have a kappa score, which is on the y-axis, of better of 0.4 for a test that is, at this point in time, considered to be then appropriate for use in a clinical arena. And we can see that there are, are tests that we do okay with, and there are tests that we don't do very well with. And unfortunately, the tests in the supine and prone position are the ones that we typically use to determine our t treatment and the success of treatment. And if our tests aren't valid, then we really don't have an ability to determine whether or not the techniques we're using are appropriate nor whether or not those techniques have shown any benefit. Um, so once again, this is an example of the, of the value of, of this work. Now, this is now looking at those tests, looking at the asymmetry on that x-axis of, of those particular tests. So, um, and as we talked about with the Kappa score, anything above that line is valuable from or, or appropriate for clinical use. And so when we're looking at asymmetries between zero and two, we have no data to indicate that any of those tests are valid. In fact, if anything, it everything indicates that we don't have the ability at this moment to accurately localize things at that level. At two to four millimeters, it's not any better. But uh, from four to six and beyond, we're now seeing that our skills are actually entering into those that are appropriate for clinical use. Uh-huh. No, th so this was with our, our um, um, this was on about 500 um, subjects with about from 80 examiners. It, it, anywhere from students to, you know, people out for 30 years. So this is just a, a, a large cross-sectional, you know, population that we, we've done that. No, no, no. They, they had some exposure to this. No, no. Um, Give me some more information. If, if you don't have a, a screen that evaluates the structural unusual, then the, the Kappa value can be skewed for whether it's the same or not. Is that a population or not a how you deal with that type of quote and quantity? Yeah. Um, the challenge, uh, once again, uh, of agreement, 
and let you, that's why you have to have a gold standard. And, and so we've used MRIs and, and ultrasound to try to figure out methodologies to do that. Uh, and that they certainly weren't applied with this data set. Um, but, but really, um, um, even if you come and you agree upon what that gold standard is, that still doesn't mean that it's accurate. So, uh, but what it does, I think what it begins to show, and once again, this is preliminary data, um, is that there's going to be a range in which the, our tests are meaningful. And I think from a clinical perspective, I think most of the time we already understand that when there's a certain degree of asymmetry, that has more meaning than if it's just slightly off. And so our hope is that, that this is going to be the clinically meaningful range of the work that we do, okay? Okay, so that's just looking at issues of asymmetry. And I'm going to just show you what we're doing with some of the other areas as well. Okay, so this is an example of, of our lab, not too, uh, very similar to what you have here. This is the Institute's lab. And we have these special rooms where up on the ceiling you see mounted, we have uh, a series of five infrared cameras which allow us to three-dimensionally evaluate uh, the position of markers. And you can maybe see on the hands of, of this examiner various reflectors on that hand. So it allows us to do very precise measurements of what that hand is doing in the examination. We use this camera system as well to, to um, calibrate the pelvic models that you have here. So we know down to, and I, I think the resolution of, of these uh, cameras are down to micrometers. I mean, they're very finely uh, re, uh, refined to find you know, where these positions are in space. And then we have our digital cameras, which are the center cameras that allow us to, to give uh, that visual feedback that you, had said, that you had seen earlier. We now also have large screens that are on our walls so that as you are doing it, you can have those things come up. You can see it immediately. You can see it very clearly so you have uh, visual feedback. You can see on the camera on the smaller computers that um, uh, the, the, the reflective markers and we can do all the a variety of measurements. And the other screen is uh, we have pressure sensing system where we look at forces which allow us then, then to combine this data and look at with when we apply force how much displacement is occurring uh, at the same time. Okay. And this is the, the um, uh, technology that they used in the creation of the Gollum um, and the Polar Express and, and so forth. Um, okay. So this is, uh, oh, uh, we had some video clips. We won't be able to show them because they didn't get loaded onto the system. But anyway, so here, uh, this is for looking at uh, motion testing of, of, this is the lumbar spine. We have uh, these uh, uh, sensor pads, or 16 sensors within one of these pads. We have reflectors on the thumb, and they would go through and they would press one side versus another to look at, at the rotational uh, preference of, of that segment. Um, and from that, we would get uh, both the pressure data as well as the displacement data. And we get these types of curves. So, so the dashed line is pressure. The solid line is, is um, um, in fact, the dashed line is the right hand. The solid line is the left hand. And both of those are looking at pressures, OK? Uh, and then this is then looking at the displacement of the right and left hand. So in one, one set, we are looking at the peaks of the data. On this one, we are looking at the troughs to look at the relative forces. So what this allows us to do is to look at, OK, uh, am I generating the same type of force when I'm using my right hand and left hand? And you can see here that the uh, dashed line until that last pump, pump was, was doing less amount of force than the other hand. We don't know without looking at displacement uh, data whether that is because 
um, 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 that's what they intended to do. It may be that the side that was restricted, you were actually generating more force because you're hitting a barrier versus when there's not the barrier, it's moving away from you so you can't generate the same amount of force. You just can't use one, one set of data in order to, to interpret it. So we, we look at both of those simultaneously. So here you can see the peak of the force in red, the displacement below, and you can see how those relationships vary a little bit based off of uh, the individual trial in which that's been performed. Okay, is that, you understand what we're doing there? Okay, all right. So that's that, uh, allowing us to look at motion restriction. We've done that with ASIS compression tests. We have a major um, uh, set of data that's being worked through at this point in time. We're using uh, this for the flexion tests. These are, I'm assuming, the lateralization tests you have already gotten presented with. So we we have a major um, uh, amount of data that we're looking through at that the, at this point on that information. And so looking at um, uh, tender points, uh, this is what we're doing right now. So identifying tenderness. So um, what we are we've decided to look at the supraspinatus muscle as our our frame of reference. And, and what we've done is we've used these reflectors in a very standard way in order for us to, to create a, 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 um, a numerical surface for that body. So we know based off of where each of those landmarks are three-dimensionally where that surface overlying the supraspinatus is. And then we then model that with our computer software. And we can do this, and, and we now can actually rotate these in any position in order to look at, uh, at what we're doing. So in the top one is an algometer, is the representation, and we're comparing what we do by palpation to what standard algometry is doing. And we can rotate it. So we, here you can see this is kind of if we were looking on the view of the patient, and that is our thumb, that's the point in which we'd be testing, okay? And from that, we can then quantify, you know, um, the, the amount of force that they are generating. And so the blue line, this is um, three uh, different examiners here. Uh, so we can look at the, the, the force applied. Actually, the force that was applied is in, in red. So, so we can look at, at the speed in which the force was being, or the pressure was being applied. Um, the amount of displacement was, is in the black line. And then the red, purple, and green actually are orientation uh, parameters. We can look at whether they were pushing towards the head, towards the spine, towards the feet where they're pushing straight down into the body or b obliquely. Uh, and so we can, we can uh, now clearly assess um, the palpatory technique uh, in, in very precise ways. And I, I had intended to add one more slide in it, but we can actually n look at the course of, of that whole process. And so we, we can show uh, one examiner who who headed in one direction and then ended up localizing the point here versus another person just went straight down and doing it and did the, the, the characteristics of how the palpation was done, did that actually change the paint pressure pr thresholds, uh, the sensitivity of that individual? Um, so we're using basically the, the, the Vicon um, a motion capturing system, which is a, uh, a well-established system. And then we have a Novell pressure pad system, which is also uh, one of the premier systems out of Germany that we're using. Any, any questions on that? I don't have that data to, 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 to know that. Um, 
And that happened to be the algometry. Yeah, the palpation was very similar. The algometry wasn't. So we had three examiners and an algometer in this data set. And we found two examiners were very consistent. One examiner was an outlier. And the algometer had its own unique characteristics as well. And so we're now trying to understand what, uh, what, why this is. Um, and we're, we've been working with one of the leading researchers in musculoskeletal pain out of Denmark with this work. And, and he thinks this is just incredible, that this is just opening up a, a whole new area of understanding. Because once again, the evidence base right now says algometry and palpation do, aren't, aren't reliable. And, and depending upon whether you're a basic scientist or a clinician, says which one's right. And, and, and the reality is, is that there, that's, it's not a right or wrong answer. There's a lot of complex issues here. And, and this is going to allow us to tease through those. Oh, okay. So we use this technology in the our pneumonia study, which uh, the multi, um, um, multi-center osteopathic pneumonia uh, study in the elderly, which we call MOPSI. And so we use this, and what I'll show you is what we did for the thoracic uh, pump. This is a, a, a technique to help to improve uh, lymphatic flow and, and, and to uh, help improve uh, clearing of secretions within the lungs. Uh, so we have our standard protocol. This is actually what this uh, sensor system, which was different than the one I just showed you. This has very, very um, dense number of sensors. There was uh, almost 400 sensors on this particular pad. So you could actually see you know, you could see the carpal bones and the metacarpal bones and which ones were creating more force than other parts of the surface of the, of the hand. Uh, and from that, we can actually now, uh, we had 81 different exam, uh, treaters in that study. We can define, you know, what forces were used at baseline, at peak force. We can look at the typical slope of how those forces were done. We can look at the rate in which those forces were done, which are all important aspects of this particular technique. We can then use that to look at outcomes, uh, and we can look at variations in, in the population from the elderly female uh, versus you know, the, the, the thick farmer, Midwestern farmer, where you needed more force. And we can be then begin looking at you know, issues of safety as well as efficacy in the treatments that we do. Um, so that's just an example of how we're applying this in a treatment perspective. And the, this is an example of four different examiner techniques looking at the pressure that they generate. Um, and we can see um, uh, the flattening out generally is where the person is doing their inhalation and you're kind of holding uh, the pressure. And then as you start, um, um, this is I guess the Kuchera form of this particular technique. Uh, as they breathe out, you give kind of a vibratory component to that. And so there's typically kind of a stair-stepping component to, to this technique. And you can see some people, it all occurred within their first inhalation, all of the forces that they did. And others, like in, in on this column, where you could see you know, exactly how that technique was being performed. So we have a way now of assessing uh, technique um, that currently we, all we could do is just observe and hope that the techniques were being done. But as I said from the very beginning, when you're taught a technique from a distance and you're asked to, to practice it, all of a sudden your techniques become very different. And while you may be consistent on how you do it, at times, we are, we're able to see that a lot of times we're not as consistent as we think we are as well. And, and then once again, it reinforces the importance of developing objective feedback parameters so you can, as you're being educated, you can calibrate what you're doing to know that, that, that it has a certain validity in, 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 in the real world. Okay. So this is our full lab, and as you can see, I mean, and this was one of our early testing uh, scenarios. So uh, we had basically the models that you use here. 
were distributed throughout this lab. We were doing, you know, almost half the class all at the same time. Um, and we've come a long way in, in our procedures. Um, but, you know, once again, if you had all of these tables filled up with people and you have five or six faculty members trying to get around to give some type of confirmation, is it a surprise that when you finish up your schooling that there's diversity and variation in the skills that exist? And that's why the Research Institute and with the support of the endowment uh, that we have is really trying to develop systems that will provide you with objective feedback. And I, I, I congratulate Marion for recognizing the value, getting some aspects of this available here as, as your school starts. Um, so uh, lastly, I just want to let you know that uh, what we have done is we've developed a, a um, um, program called Advancing Skills in Osteopathy. And this program, uh, the ASO, we've used those terms because the founding school of, of, of osteopathic medicine, it was the American School of Osteopathy. And so advancing skills in osteopathy um, is, is where this name came from. And our goal is to enrich the 21st century practitioner by incorporating the most advanced objective scientific methods for training and palpation with an intimate experience of osteopathic history. Um, uh, so our goal is to provide meaningful and timely feedback so you can develop more standardized performance and interpretation of the techniques that are currently being done within the profession to help demonstrate the accuracy and reliability of the diagnostic skills both before and after treatment uh, to um, determine the accuracy on um, um, since looking at accuracy on humans has not been practical, uh, we've developed models in order to help demonstrate accuracy, which you have already experienced on a certain level. And then using the camera systems that I just showed you uh, to help objectify uh, feedback when you are examining humans. We do this, uh, uh, we have a 15-hour course and a 30-hour course that we also work with the staff at the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine uh, where you go and you, and you actually work within the museum and get behind the scenes in the archives to learn more deeply about how osteopathic medicine was developed. Uh, we have the, uh, act, this is actually the cabin that Dr. Still was born in. We have the first school that we keep under glass. We have definitely anxiety uh, over uh, leaving our past behind, so we keep it all very close to us in Kirksville. So you get to, to hear stories and to get a whole another uh, level of appreciation about the history of, of, of osteopathic medicine, why we are who we are today, but also with the most advanced aspects that science can bring within this program. So we're very, very uh, uh, happy to offer this program. Uh, um, right now, we are actually uh, putting on a program this summer uh, directed towards uh, student people in training, um, and there are scholarships associated with that. I can tell you that most of those scholarships will probably be uh, given to people who are residents or higher along in their training program, but keep this in mind because this will continue, uh, and so, you know, as you get more experience, we would love to have you come and, and get a whole nother level of, of feedback regarding the skills that you've developed. Any, uh, any questions for me? Yes, yes. So, so uh, as I said, 15 hours is kind of our weekend workshop, and then we have a 30-hour program that we put uh, throughout uh, a, a week's time. Uh, the week works well from a student's perspective when they're on break. It doesn't work very well with practicing <coughs> clinicians, and so, so we're trying to figure out the best way 
And so I think that the 15 hour weekend type course is, is the way that will work for people who are in practice. And then we have people throughout the world who are coming for kind of almost a pilgrimage to, to the osteopathic Mecca wha- where they take a week long program like this as well. So currently, there there are a total of three schools that have incorporated into their curriculum, and we've been developing. I think this we're in our sixth year of our database in Kirksville, uh, so we're analyzing from class to class, test to test, skills uh, that we're demonstrating, and and hopefully we're refining our curriculum so that one each year we're showing better results. And we can show that across campuses. We have four other schools that are at various levels of of involving. Uh, this um, uh, program. Um, there's a couple of satellite campuses that are going to have very small uh, groups of students, and our hope is to, to, from the very beginning, bring in the camera systems and so forth. I mean, it's very difficult when you have 150 people to outfit a lab with all of those things. When you have a group of 30 or 40 in that class, then it becomes much more realistic, and we're hoping that we can get that established from the ground start with some of these new campuses as well. All osteopathic, that's correct. Well, uh, so it's a great question. Our, our game plan at this point in time is that we want to bring um, uh, people from uh, the national boards to kind of see our whole system. And we've been wanting to do that for about a year and a half. We may be able to get that accomplished. Our goal is this summer will be, you know, if the national boards like having objective parameters, which I know they will, associated with evaluating palpation, which then will elevate their examination significantly then I think it it will become generalized very quickly. Okay.
Thank you. I know you all need to run, so please do because you got class, and I, I see Dr. Kajara has already left. So, thank you so much for spending your your lunch break for with me. Yeah, yeah, and I look forward to seeing you all throughout 